Okay, so in this video I'm going to talk a bit about Newton's laws and how we can apply them to some different scenarios that we're going to come across. Now, Newton's first law is probably the most counterintuitive law, that's one we don't understand, so I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a second. But, just to state what it is, it's that a body remains at rest, and a body is just another word for like an object or something like that, it remains at rest or remains stationary, or it maintains a constant velocity unless it's acted on by a force. So in essence, an object stays in mo the same motion it was unless you apply a force. Okay, Newton's second law, this is the one most people have heard of before, that a resultant force acting on a body is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration. So essentially what it means is if you apply a resultant force to an object, it will accelerate and you can calculate the relationship between those using the mass. And Newton's third law is a little bit confusing. It's that if you've got two objects in contact with each other, say like a phone sitting on a desk or like two people pushing each other, if one applies a force to the other, the other one will apply an equal force but in the opposite direction. So your mobile phone sitting on your table is applying a weight force downwards and the table is applying a normal contact force upwards to prevent it from falling to the centre of the earth. And that's an example of that, but I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. So, Newton's first law, the most complicated one. Now you won't actually be using this too much, but understanding it is very important to understand what's going on. This is the law that your brain will tell you is all wrong, because we as humans have no understanding of this. Because we as humans live in a world dominated by friction. Like, we are not capable of being in an environment where there aren't forces acting on objects. So, if you're driving in your car, you are at 70 miles an hour driving on the motorway. You have to be pushing the accelerator to keep going at 70 miles an hour. So, you're thinking about this Newton's first law and you're going, that's not right, I'm having to apply a force to keep going forwards at the same speed. But the problem is, you're applying a force to overcome the aerodynamic drag and other frictional forces. You're not applying a resultant force which would cause it to accelerate. So that one's a little bit confusing, Newton's first law. We don't have to use it too much, but you do need an understanding of that. So let's move on to Newton's second law. So this is the one that explains why objects fall at the same rate when they're acted on by gravity in a vacuum. There's a really good video by Brian Cox where they use a giant nuclear bunker to show this. Really cool on YouTube, check it out. Anyway, so essentially what it's saying is we've got an object and we're going to apply a force F. And whenever I'm talking resultant forces I'm going to always talk about FR. It's result for. And we're saying it has mass m. And what it's saying is essentially that it will accelerate at a value a. So you've got this relationship f is equal to m a. When they get slightly more confusing is if we're not instead of applying this, say we're using a rope and we're applying a tension force, but we have some friction acting on it. So in that case, what you would find in this case is the resultant force would be the tension minus the friction, and that would be equal to the mass times the acceleration. So it's the resultant force, the force that's actually causing it to accelerate, not overcoming frictional forces. So that's Newton's second law. So let's have a look at an example where this is used. We've got a car engine, so talk, going back to an example we before, supplying a driving force. A driving force is a force which is trying to cause something to accelerate. And it's of 2,000 newtons. So let's do a little sketch, see how good my car drawing is on here. That is possibly the best drawing of a car I've ever done. Anyway, so we've got a driving force of 2,000 newtons. Um, it weighs 800 kilograms, it's pretty standard for a small size car, 
It's travelling at 30 metres per second, which is, in terms of Newton's second law, utterly irrelevant, and is accelerating at 2 metres per second. Ooh, that's sloppy, that should be a minus 2. Okay, calculate the resistive force that's acting on it. So, if we've got this acceleration and we've got this mass, we can work out the resultant force that would be required to cause that to happen. And then we can compare that to the force you're actually applying and the difference between them will be the frictional force. So let's calculate the resultant force first of all. Again, using Newton's second law, F equals ma, so it's just going to be 800 times by 2 gives you 1600 newtons. So if we want to find the friction, which we usually call F, it's going to be the driving force, so FD, subtract the resultant force, it's the difference between the two, so it's 2000 minus 1600, which is obviously 400 newtons. So that's just a fairly simple example of how you could apply Newton's second law to calculate something useful in a particular scenario. Okay, so let's move on to Newton's third law, which can be a little bit tricky. Before we do that, there is the full written out working if you couldn't read my handwriting. So pause it if you need. And as I said, moving on to the third law. So this is the one I talked earlier with. So you've got two bodies in contact. If one applies a force to the other, the other object applies an equal force, but in the opposite direction. And the easiest example is the one I spoke of earlier. We've got a table, we've got an object sitting on it, and we know that it's applying a weight force, so W, which means that the table must be applying an equal and opposite force that way. And this force is called a normal contact force, which is given the abbreviation NCF. And a normal contact force always acts perpendicularly to the surface. So let's give a slightly more complex example. Say we had a slope, and again we had this, and that's at an angle there. So we know the weight force is acting like that, but the normal contact force is going to be acting in this direction. So the weight force has a component in that direction and these normal contact forces, these Newton's third law forces always act perpendicular to a surface. So in this scenario, so let's have a look over here, so the normal contact force over here is just going to be mg or like, it's going to be w I've called it in this case, whereas over here the normal contact force is going to be w times by the cosine of theta. And if you don't know what I'm doing with the resolving forces, please go back and watch my resolving forces video so you can understand what I'm doing there. We've already covered it in the course I'm teaching, so you need to have a look at that. Okay, so that's that. So that's one example of Newton's third law, and we've met normal contact forces. Um, there's another example we get where we've got a rope with tension. So let's scroll that down. So say we have a lift and we've got a rope attached to our lift like this. And let's say it's just stationary for the time being. So we know there's going to be a weight force acting down on this. But if this is stationary in equilibrium, that must mean there's a tension force acting up here which is causing it to remain stationary. So it's equal and opposite force. Tension forces you should be familiar with. You can see them anytime you hang something on a string. There's a, you can see that the string goes tight because it's holding up. That's tension, and that's another example of using it. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. The first one, just about Newton's third law. The second one, looking at combining the second and the third law. Okay, so we've got a reaction force from a table, so similar to what we're looking at, of a mass of 2 kilograms, and we want to know what the reaction force is when it's horizontal and when it's at an angle. So let's do a sketch for the first one. So we've got an object here, 
got a um, force of 2g acting down, and that must mean by Newton's third law there's a force like that, which is equal and opposite. So the normal contact force is just going to be mg, which is equal to 2 times 9.8, which is just 19.6 newtons. Like that. Look at another example where we had it like this at 30 degrees. Got a weight force that way. Normal contact force is acting that way. So let's have a look. So we know this is 30 degrees. If we draw a line down here like this. If that's 30 degrees and that's a right angle, we know that's going to be 60 degrees. And if this is a right angle, we, therefore that one there must be 30 degrees. So therefore your normal contact force is going to be mg, so 2g times where the cosine is 30 which is uh, 2 times 9.8 times what, cosine 30, which gives you a total force of 17.0 newtons. The normal kind of force is going to be slightly smaller because it's at an angle. And again, here's the typed out ones. I've noticed subsequently that I've made a typo error there. It should be 19.6, not 18.6, but the other one is the same as the value you see on the previous side. Okay, so let's look at combining the laws together. Our problems get more challenging. So we've got a lift problem. So let's draw ourselves a lift and it's going upwards, it's accelerating at 2 meters per second minus 2. Um, it's got a cable supplying a tension and it's got somebody standing inside the lift. So the lift itself is going to have a weight force of a, hundred, of a thousand G and this person here is going to have a weight force of 100 g. So it wants you to calculate the tension in the cable and the normal contact force acting on the 100 kilogram person standing in the lift. So let's do the tension first of all. So we need the resultant force, which we know is going to be ma. So that's going to be 1,100 because you need the total mass of the system. Okay. And which gives you Newtons. And then, so the tension is going to be your resultant force plus the weight force. Which is going to be equal to newtons or uh, fourteen point zero kilonewtons to three significant figures. So, in terms of calculating the normal contact force, we need to consider the force on the person. So, we know that the normal kind of force must be supplying the weight force on a person, but the person is also being caused to accelerate by the lift floor. So the normal contact force must also be supplying the resultant force on that person. So, let's first of all calculate the resultant force. So that would be mass times acceleration. So it's going to be 100 because we're just looking at the person now which gives you 200 newtons. The weight force is, is acting downwards, so it's just going to be 100 g, which is just 980 newtons. So that means the normal contact force 
just be adding those two things together, which gives you one one zero newtons there. So that's the end of that problem. So just to highlight, this one up here is the tension force. This one here is your normal contact force from the floor acting up on the person.